You're listening to The Thrive Podcast, where every week we dive into a practical, tactical tip to bring you from a life of simply surviving to thriving. It's personal development for the everyday girl who is done with coasting through her days, done with feeling like she's missing out on the deeper meaning of her own life, and done with mediocrity once and for all. Because it's not enough to simply survive, you deserve to thrive. Welcome back to Thrive. In today's episode, I'm sitting down with my friend and hairstylist, Mary Tomasetti. She's just behind the microphone instead of behind my head. (laughs) Mary is an extensions and precision color specialist. She was actually the first to bring hand-tied extensions, which is the kind of extensions that I have, to the entire East Coast. She's a total prodigy, being only 21 years old and a leader in her industry. She's traveled the country to learn new techniques and bring the very best to her clients. Mary and I have had quite the journey together, so I can't wait for you to hear her story because this girl is truly thriving and slaying the game. So be sure to stay tuned through this episode, drop us your thoughts on social media, and without further ado, welcome Mary. Hi, Erica. Thank you so much for having me (laughs) and for those kinds of words. That was so sweet. Um, (laughs) I definitely never thought I would be on a podcast, especially one as amazing as this. So I am just completely flattered and beyond excited to be here. I know. I knew I had to have you on the second we were talking and you told me you were a big podcast fan. And I said, well, you should come on mine and you just about lost your mind. So I think this was, this is going to be totally awesome. I'm really pumped. <laughs> well, me too. So I first found you, of course, in doing my due diligence and research on hair extensions once I knew I wanted to try them postpartum because I knew you specialized in obviously a very unique kind of extension that really limits any damage or breakage, which is, of course, ideal. (laughs) So can you fill listeners in on what hand-tied extensions actually are and what you specialize in as a hairstylist and maybe just like more of your story as to how you came to fall in love with hair in the first place? Absolutely. So hand-tied extensions are extensions placed in rows utilizing a beaded technique to create a track using your natural hair. We take the actual extension hair, which is like a thin fabric track, which then makes what's called a weft of hair. So you'll hear me say weft, just so everybody knows <laughs> that. <laughs> to help create a visual for our listeners, like you can kind of picture a hula skirt cut in one spot so it's no longer a circle. Oh, wait, and that's, that's so smart. <laughs> that's what it looks like. I, I yeah. feel like it's hard for people to understand. <laughs> but so that's kind of your image of a weft of hair, but obviously it's this beautiful, long, luxurious, soft hair. <laughs> um, but we place the wefts on the tracks that we made using your natural hair and then gently sew them in. The strategic placement of the extension follows the natural fall of your hair. So that allows for less tension, optimizing your comfort and flexibility. And to clarify, sewing them in does not mean what I originally and stupidly thought it meant, (laughs) where literally when I first met you, I told you, I thought you were literally going to be like, like needle and thread sewing something to my head, which was terrifying. (laughs) That was was the first time I heard that. And that was when I realized (laughs) every extension consultation after that, I was very sure to clarify. (laughs) Like, to clarify, here's what sewing it in means. <laughs> you just sew it to your natural hair, not your head. There is no right. other problem, we promise. <laughs> um, so there are, there are several application methods, but the application method that my partner, Kara, and I use, it's wonderful because there are no harmful elements, chemicals, glue, or tape. Uh, and another great quality is that they give you the option to have maximum fullness and maximum length, but at the same time, they're undetectable. So you're not worried about them slipping out or anything like that. The actual term, hand-tied extensions, it's blown up everywhere. I mean, oh yeah, I absolutely love that it has, but when a market explodes like that, it's important to know exactly what you're getting mm-hmm. and not confuse true hand-tied extensions and so in extensions. Many people kind of have said, that they do hand-tied extensions, but it could just be another word for sew-in, which I think is pretty legit. I mean, hand-tied, hand-sew, like, same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but typical sew-in extensions are very damaging to the hair. That's why I never performed that service. I actually did it before on mannequins and whatnot, and I was like, oh my goodness, I can never do this on a person. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then there's actual hand-tied hair. 
So hand tied hair means that the physical hair extensions are sewn onto the weft as described earlier with hands, like they're, people are hand tying this hair to the weft. So that's mm-hmm. what hand tied means. So now that you know the difference, <laughs> you just want to be sure that you're sl- like, if you're getting it done, that this hand tied meme isn't just a quicker method being sewn in that could possibly damage your hair. So right. Cause I, I mean, there are so many different types of extensions that I had absolutely no idea of before you were explaining them all to me. And I was like, holy mackerel, the difference in them and the difference in how they may or may not damage your hair is like astounding. You really have to know what you're doing before you go into and go in for it. Yeah. And you can, I mean, you obviously know firsthand when I'm in there on you, there's a lot of things you can do wrong. There's a lot of things that can be done quickly. And Kara and I, we learned, we were traveling all over, but we learned multiple methods because we took the one and although you feel confident and I loved it, I really, I fell in love with it, but then you look at another one and another one and we've taken two classes on methods that we'll never use. And yeah, it's tough to like throw that money in, but that was money well spent. I know, I now know how to take them out if somebody does them and it's just so important to use your judgment and not just trust what somebody is doing. Because when it comes to this, like I'm responsible. I want my client's hair to be more amazing when they take these extensions out. I don't want them having damage or breakage or anything like that. There's no reason. What's the reason Mm -hmm. for that point? So our other thing that we do a ton of is precision color. Uh, When I feel like this word, this term is kind of getting overused, but I mean, it is what it is. Making sure that our clients have total comfort in knowing their hand tied extensions are going to be colored flawlessly to blend with their own hair. It's, I mean, that's priceless. But even without extensions, it's important to know exactly what you're doing. You have these people that want to go super blonde in one session. And it's, it's so important to educate them on what it takes and to be precise in your application and in the products you're using to make sure you're always using the best products so that you can assure them that things are going to be good and absolutely they're going to have amazing hair absolutely yeah (laughs) so how tell us also a little bit about your story in terms of how long you've been doing hair because I mean like I said you're 21 and you're basically a prodigy but you're like such an expert in your field already so walk us through like your story of how you came to be doing this all right so I was I was very fortunate in that I knew I wanted to be in this industry from a very young age. Uh, my grandmother who did hair, I was always fascinated. I'm like, how does she do this? What? <laughs> like, give me all the things. Like, I just, <laughs> I thought it was so awesome. And every time I left her, I always felt amazing. I was always like, this is the best thing ever. Like, how do I make more people feel like this? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that was my first, that's where I first started getting interested in it. But when it came time to decide about what to do for college, my parents were very adamant on going to school and they said, go to school. And then later on, you can look into being a stylist. I didn't fight it as much because I was always, I was always business oriented. I always loved business and really did have a passion for learning. But when you think about not going to college, you have every type of stereotyping thrown in your face by peers and people who don't know the industry. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything you could imagine. It's you even just say it. Oh, I I might want to become a hairstylist. It's you won't make any money doing that. You can't do anything without a degree. That's the easy way out. You're just not going to go to school. Mm. Like anyone can do hair. You hear these things over and over again. And at the time, I was fortunate enough to work at a great salon and. I saw how these girls made people feel and the environment was, it was awesome, but it's tough because it's, there's so much pressure to go to school or go for a few years and figure it out. And then, and there is something to be said for trying school out. I'm definitely not saying that if you think you might want to do something else to run full force and do it, but it's important to really look into it and really research and see if you're willing to put the work in. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, despite the opposition, I knew I had to start my career, my hair career, as soon as possible. I was like, I, I just know this is for me. Mm-hmm. It was in part like this like burning thing. I'm like, this is it needs to happen. There's no other questions about it. So I dove into the industry head first, having uh, three out of four parents not 
<laughs> not in for it. My, it was funny. My stepmom was actually the only one that was like, no, you need to do this. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I definitely still have respect for my parents for saying to go to school because it's understandable. They, they did that and that was their path and they succeeded wonderfully at it. But I just, I knew it wasn't for me. So I kind of had to just do what I knew it was right. And if it looks that easy, like anyone can do hair, I can confirm it is not. <laughs> oh, I mean, I can't even braid my own hair correctly, let alone like braid, do some, something on somebody else's. <laughs> I know, it's so funny when you think of it like that. But uh, yeah, one piece of advice is I can give for that is if you're not super passionate about hair, you're not ready to stand on a concrete floor for 14 hours a day and put in overtime work. It's just, it's not for you. And I'm not saying that you need to be as insane as I am and never want to stop thing <laughs> and just do it all the time. Uh, I'm definitely not saying that that's what needs to happen because there are so many people that have a great like family life balance, but it's you, you're building it yourself. You're, you can work at a great salon and you know, you can have the guidance, but it's all on you at the end of the day. So, yeah. So did you ever doubt your choice in career then since you started so young or did you ever consider in the back of your head, maybe I should try something else? Or were you really like 100% from the get-go, I'm doing hair. This is what I know. This is what I love. And like, I'm not turning back. Once I got into it, I never, I never felt like, shoot, was this the right thing? In the beginning, just like any job, when you're starting out, you're, the money is, it's not good. It's not there. And You have to put in a lot of extra work and you need to make people trust you. I mean, it's a lot asking for somebody's trust, especially on their hair. Like no one wants their hair messed up. And you do (laughs) have people that are more free with it and just say, yeah, you can do whatever you want, but you need to come in on a Sunday and make it work for people and do, I'm not saying like do hair for free, but in the beginning you need people to trust you and you have to give up your profit for that. I mean, Mm -hmm. you're learning and you need to respect and appreciate that people are willing to let you learn on them. So in the beginning, there's the money's not there, but I mean, if you have a passion and you know, this is what you want to do and you see how people walk away feeling after you're with them and that's priceless. I always just knew I'm like, if I just do this right for the right reasons, the money will come. Mm -hmm. I didn't, hear that somewhat like I I just felt like I knew that I'm like no if I just do this how I think it'll just work out that's actually (laughs) the process was where I was so and I definitely think I was naive in thinking that but I think there's a lot of truth to that uh if you believe in something and you'll do anything to make it work it works so for that reason I didn't have too much doubt uh again I was also I was in a good environment to be able to grow and, and learn and I mean with Instagram and everything. The education is at your fingertips. I mean, mm-hmm. you can pay for classes online, $30 a month, $10 a month, and sit there and watch classes all that. It's not hard to learn, which was awesome. That's another huge part. But yeah, well, so- it's funny. It's funny too what you said, because I think you're absolutely right. Like hair in general is probably kind of like an unforgiving industry in that if someone comes and has a bad experience or has a horrible haircut, they're never going back. It's kind of like, it's make or break every time someone is in your chair. So it's funny that you've mentioned how it might not necessarily have been respected the same way as going to school would have been for some people, because it's like in the same way, it's, it might be similar to like going to the doctor or something where like, if you have a bad experience, you don't want to go back or from the from the physician standpoint, if you do a bad job on someone, you could actually hurt them or damage them in some way. So it's funny that it doesn't have necessarily more respect from that standpoint because it's like, dude, no, it is really important in how people feel and it might feel superficial to some, but like, come on, at the end of the day, I think most people could probably agree that if you have a good hair day, you feel really freaking good and it changes your whole mood. It changes everything even if it's just in terms of how you carry yourself and how you feel in terms of your confidence, which in and of itself can like transform your life. So props to you because girl, it's important. Yeah, it is important. And it's just like you said, I mean, watching people leave feeling amazing is awesome. And on one end it's, yeah, you don't want to mess up someone's hair, but that's why there's education. That's why I couldn't get enough education. I was, I was afraid to mess someone's hair up. I was afraid. I never, 
never wanted to do that. You know what I mean? That's why I'm practicing all mannequins and whatnot. But it also a huge part of it is communication. Like with how you were just saying, if you have bad haircut and they don't want to come back, I feel like one thing I have with my clients that's super valuable in is that I'm very open with them. Are you sure you love it? If you're home and three days later, this you have a piece of hair that's bothering you, call me, message me. And that's where in starting my own business, I was able to really start to contact my clients in a more personal way and be 100% sure that I'm doing everything I can because now it's, it's not just for me, it's for my partner, it's for my other people. And growing something like that, you need to make sure that people are happy. And it just means even more to me now that people feel amazing. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, then I can say, amazing, come back in, let's fix this. We're going to do it until we get it right. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. having that flexibility is everything because people appreciate that more than anything. Totally. So you mentioned your own business. Uh, so there was, I know this was, there was this really pivotal point in your career <laughs> that I happened to experience firsthand since I was with you <laughs> when it was happening, <laughs> but you got fired and started your own business all in the same 24 hours, which is crazy. So <laughs> talk to us about that because that's not even like a surviving to thriving story. It's like a dying to thriving story. So tell us all about that crazy experience. Yeah. So <laughs> loaded question. I love it. Um, so this industry is tough. There's actually a podcast I listen to called this ugly beauty industry and it's the truth. It's yeah, it's definitely tough. So I had grown up in the salon and they, they were amazing. They really, they helped me grow in such great ways. I was so young when I started. I was just at such an influenceable age. Everything they did seemed so amazing. And as you grow, obviously things change. I definitely changed. My dreams got bigger. It's hard when you're not surrounded by everything you want to be surrounded by and you don't have control over it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult. I mean, and it's emotional when you're going to work every single day and you're not feeling like this is the best thing for me. And it's not, and I it really, I don't want to say anything negative about anyone there because everyone has their own motivations. People, you Absolutely. know, family is more important to people, children going away. I mean, there are so many things they could have somebody sick at home. Like there are so many motivations to work that you can't expect people to be super happy at work. And you can't expect people to find positivity. Yeah. You can't, unfortunately. And that was like a that was kind of deep to say right there, but yeah, you can't. And I feel like I expected that from people. I expected everyone to just think the best in everyone and want to build everybody up. And that's not how people are. Mm -hmm. It's how we hope people are, but it's like everyone's on their own journey and not necessarily at the same place as you in your positivity and joy journeys in life. Mm -hmm. It's true. I think it was also hard for me. I definitely personally was struggling with just a lot of anxiety mentally. And I had a lot going on internally and just come to work and still try to be super positive because when I'm with my clients, like I feel like I'm in my own world. I'm able to listen to them and give them feedback, make them feel better about themselves. Again, I'm in my own world. Like I, I don't matter anymore when I'm in that state. So when you're in the back room and you're thinking about clients and you're, you have positivity, but you also you have negativity and you have people reaching out to you just to be negative. It's tough. And there's things going on behind the scenes that maybe didn't even mean to be bad or mean to be negative, but they appear that way because it's all about perception. Mm -hmm. It's everything is perception. Somebody could be doing something thinking they're doing the best thing for somebody. And somebody else can look at it and say, wow, how could they do that? That was terrible. Yeah. But, and it's all, and that's all lack of communication. I, I think I feel like I've learned that, but it, long story short, it wasn't, for me anymore. I knew that I had changed, things had changed, and it was time for me to move on. So I had seen these salon suites popping up. I had looked into going to another salon, but I felt like another salon is going to be the same thing. And did I think I was ready to full force start and open my own salon? Absolutely not. Um, but I had started to look into these salon suites and it really seemed like an amazing thing to do. And a coworker of mine at the time and I had been working on our marketing, our client follow-ups. We had the same vision for how we wanted our clients to be treated and how we wanted our clients to feel. 
and how passionate we were about it, you can't expect anyone else to be that passionate about it. It's kind of like you have it or you don't. Again, not saying that it's bad if you don't have that. It's, you know, priorities are in different places for people, but we were in the same alignment. And I had known her for three weeks and we booked a trip together to go learn hand tied extensions. Mm -hmm. And a month after that, we were looking into another form and it was this journey that we started together with somebody I, I didn't even know really, but it was kind of one of those things like when you know, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I expressed to her about, she knew how I was feeling about everything and she knew I needed to make a move. It just was the best thing. So we started looking into this suite within a month. We're full force working on it. We were like, this is what we want. Trying so many things. I mean, the to-do list was never ending. We were planning on, you know, we were like, all right, in a couple months we can do this. And it's hard because in this industry, you can't, you can't just go up to people and say, yeah, I think I want to start my own thing and it's going to be great. And I'm going to work here until that. And then once that opens, then I'll go over there. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. And it's hard because I wish it worked like that. I wish I could do that, but at the same time, it's, you need to look out for yourself. I'm like, okay, I have a mortgage. Like, I need to pay my mortgage. I need to pay my electric bill for this house that I just bought. And this all happened a few months, actually, after I had settled on my house. So it was so insane, but in my heart, I knew that this is what had to happen. That day that I had gotten fired was not how I thought it would be at all. I looked up to my boss a lot, and she helped me through a lot, for sure. And I never want to downplay that because I'm definitely so thankful for everything she ever taught me. Uh, again, things change and it was time for me to go. So I had sat down with her, we were chatting and it was basically like, I know you're not happy. And I was like, no. And I have to be honest with you. Like I'm looking at other options and it's, it was so hard for me. Cause I'm like, I want to tell you, I want to tell you everything, but I can't because I have this salon suite that's half empty with boxes in it and I can't, I can't just start, but I can't expect someone to keep me at their place of business knowing I'm going to leave. I said like, look, I, I don't know when, I don't know when I'm doing this because we were still far away from opening. I said, but I am, I, I need to, I need to go away. I need to do something else. And I, that's, that's that. And so then from that point on, it was that later that day, it was, all right, that's enough. We are. Yeah. So it was just like, <laughs> down here and you can go. And I was like, wow, I, okay. I had to just soak it all in. And there was nothing to do at that point, except to do it, like nothing to it, but to do it. Uh, I, they began calling my clients just to tell them I'm no longer there. And I had clients reaching out to me left and right. I couldn't even, I had 98 voicemails at one point <gasps> wow. of people calling me and calling me again. And I have this space that's not ready. So uh, I called Kara. Kara came in and we were like, all right, I have a full day of clients tomorrow and they're all calling me, freaking out. And I need to be here for them. Kara was like, yeah, you absolutely do. Kara didn't work on, uh, it was a Saturday. She doesn't work on Saturdays. So I'm going to be here. I'm going to assist you. We're going to stay here. It was a Friday there until uh, 4 a.m. <laughs> Just trying to get it somewhat presentable. And it worked. It, we were able to get it somewhat. And all the clients were so understanding. And that next day when I woke up, I was, I wasn't anxious. I was so happy. I was like, this is exactly what I need to be doing. Uh, and Kara knew the same thing. We went and it was crazy and it was stressful and it's hard. You want to, cause you want to get the whole message across to clients and but you don't want to bring any of the negativity of what happened into it. You just, you wanted to be there for them and you want to make them feel good. Mm -hmm. So the next day, we were able to do that. We got through the day. We thankfully had color. So that was great. <laughs> um, we picked up whatever we had needed and we got through it. And then from then on, it's still kind of been a whirlwind and it's tough because the space is smaller. Whereas I'm used to being in a big place where you have all this room for people and you have people reaching out. I really need to get in. I really need but you need to be considerate of the other people coming in and making sure that it's comfortable for everybody. And that was a huge challenge at the beginning was just adjusting to the space. But after following up with people and realizing it's, it was good. So that was a really long way to say everything works out. And when a door is slammed in your face, literally or figuratively, you have to take it as an opportunity and understand that, okay, 
that was it. There was nothing to say, but okay, this is what's happening. Let's do it. And that was crazy too, because it was so unexpected for you since you went in thinking that you were in control of the situation and then you were made to feel like you weren't. And it was emotional because it was people that you had basically grown up with who had been teaching you and helping you along your own journey. So that's like rejection on a whole other level. But on the flip side, you had such an exciting opportunity waiting in the wings. So, I mean, I witnessed it all firsthand since I was with you that Saturday and you guys killed it. I mean, the salon totally came together and you clearly worked so hard on it. So I would say it paid off. (laughs) Thank you. That means a lot. And it's, yeah, it's exactly, exactly what you said, but yeah, you just have to look at things with a positive attitude because if you don't, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. Like, I definitely wouldn't be where I am. So yeah, it was worth it. And now that I'm looking back at it, I'm like, okay, that happened. It was pretty crazy and kind of terrible, but it's okay. And I'm glad that it worked because people come together. You really see who's there for you. I mean, having the support of the people that I had, I, again, I'd be nothing without the people that I have around me. So mm-hmm. it, was, it was worth it and it was meant to happen that way. And Absolutely. Amazing. So what kind of treatment have you gotten from peers who are maybe older than you and not as accomplished? Because I know when I saw you at your first salon too, there were different ranks basically or different awards or levels of being a hairstylist and you were like cream of the crop here. So were you ever treated differently in the salon because of your age, whether it maybe was by clients or by managers or coworkers or anything like that? Good question. And cream of the crop, you're funny. I would never say that. Uh, <laughs> you are. But you're so sweet. Um, I grew up there. Again, I started so young. Initially, I never was treated differently because of my age. If anything, I was complimented for my work ethic that I had. I also feel like people mm-hmm. have this whole stereotype on millennials or the generation after saying nobody has a work ethic, which not nobody, but a lot of people don't. And I can agree mm-hmm. with that. But so that was one thing that always happened. It was always like, oh, she works so hard. She works so hard. And I was just like, yeah, I do. I, I like to work. I don't know. Like, yeah. whatever. <laughs> um, but I was definitely given a lot of responsibility. And it's difficult because there's obviously competition created within, within an environment like that. But I always felt like it was healthy competition. But again, that's all about perception. Mm-hmm. It, I always felt like it was healthy competition. I wanted to just build people up. If someone was shooting for a goal, I was like, yes, you got it. This is how you could do it. And it was people older than me. I'm just trying to think of ways to just help. I just want to help. I'm like, let's do it. Let's do it together. Uh, But not everyone's like that. And that's, again, that's okay. That's how people are. You can't expect people, again, you can't expect people to be positive and want you to grow. If you work hard and you're successful, you're not going to be able to be everyone's best friend. It, Mm. it's not possible. And I thought that was possible. <laughs> I was like, no, it's, it's okay. I'll just do this and I'll, I'll do fine myself. And then everyone will also be great friends and everything's fine. But there is jealousy and it's a horrible, horrible thing. People old and young love to victimize themselves. Yeah. And with victimizing themselves, it's, and that's where I'm t- saying about the priorities. Like earlier, my priority was work. I'm young and that was my priority was, okay, I want a house. I want to go on vacation. Whereas other people's are, oh, I want to make things work with my boyfriend. I want to get married. I want to have children because that's where they are in their life. And that's Mm -hmm. where they find their happiness. But you can't have it all. You can't. It's impossible. It's, I shouldn't say, I mean, no, I I, I don't know. I think it's like you can't have it all at the same time. Yes. Yes. So it's like some people will have it all throughout the course of their life, but it's very rare that you can have all of the things all of the time happening all at the same time because there's only 24 hours in a day. And like you said, there are things called priorities and choices and both have to be in place for you to get through the day. So it's real. Absolutely true. Definitely the truth. So yeah, I mean, with that, it comes people, they, not everyone. I don't want to say people like everyone as a whole, but a lot of people, they, they like to victimize themselves. And with victimizing yourself comes negativity. And mm-hmm. negativity comes misery. And unfortunately, misery loves company. Yeah. But 
it's hard to let it not affect you. It's mm-hmm. really difficult to not let that affect you. Sorry, it's terrible English, but um, so it's difficult, especially when people that are older than you, I mean, with age comes wisdom. I feel like people think that. And if you're older than somebody, you think you should have more than them. Mm. But I don't think it's true. I think you should get what you deserve and in, in the most positive of ways. So people who don't want to work for everything, they don't want to see someone successful with their life together because it reminds them of things that they aren't. If they look at somebody who has ever, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying that I was somebody who had everything in my life together. In one aspect, I had work, I had work together because I loved it. And even then I had, I know I still have so much growing to do, but when people see someone successful, it does, like it reminds them of things they aren't. And I think some people let that, they'll sit in that, they'll sit in that misery. And then other people will say, wow, I'm not like the podcast I listen to. I, I'm like, wow, I'm not that. Let me be that. Like, let me grow into that person. Mm-hmm. So again, there's healthy competition, which keeps most people working hard to improve their skills. But again, it breaks some people down and that's where it's tough. But I learned a lot from those around me, despite age, despite position, older, younger, I learned a lot. And I definitely think looking at someone for their age is, you can take it into consideration, but you can't let that be everything. Right. Because you never know what they went through. You never know where they naturally are incredibly smart. You never know. So that's where that whole agent thing comes into play. And that's only what I've learned so far. Talk to me in a year. <laughs> I'm sure I'll have a completely different answer. <laughs> I know, right? Well, how did you learn to handle yourself so well to being one of the youngest in the salon? Did you ever feel like you had to pretend like you were older than you were or treat people differently or, or carry yourself differently um, if you were ever afraid of that treatment one way or the other because of your age? That's a, that's a good question. And it's, it's funny. You said, how did I learn to handle myself so well? Because if you saw me behind the scenes, I would be like, I'm not handling myself well. It, <laughs> like, I, was, I mean, I'm definitely always hard on myself, but my parents always taught me to work hard and stay true to myself and what I believe in. And I have racing thoughts all the time, but when I was on the floor, when I was with a client, it, that's, I kind of, it was almost like a blackout. Like you just black out everything else that you're thinking about, put that behind you, black out the anxiety you wake up with, black out the what's going on about anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just, you have to stay true to what you know, stay true to yourself and what you believe in. And that's how I had to handle myself. That's how I, that's actually literally how I handled myself. I was like, okay, you need to black out everything you're thinking and know what you have to do and do that. It's acting older definitely was a part of it. And I feel like I definitely grew up quickly, but also there's, there's a respect thing. I mean, if you have someone 30 years older than you, typically they don't want to see this person that just got out of beauty school giving them advice on anything Mm -hmm. because they think you're young. You don't know anything. So Mm -hmm. in order to get respect initially, I mean, this industry is, it's judgmental. Your stylist is walking up to you and I'm, you know, you get looked up and down and their judgment's made of you within three seconds. Mm -hmm. And that's like a proven fact no matter what kind of person they are. I mean, you could be a great person. You could be someone who likes to pick out the bad things in people, but it's, you're getting judged. And overall people don't want to see a little young person thinking they know everything, which is definitely, I do not think I know remotely (laughs) everything, but you have to demand this respect for yourself and you need, I needed to act older in order to do that. So I always try to expect those around me learn from them. And then when needed, I had to speak up for myself or ask questions to get a better understanding of what was needed to be done. So to elaborate that on that a little bit, questions to me are everything. Like when you're speaking to people, if, if there's a miscommunication, if there's maybe a harsh judgment and ask, like, I'm like, what's going on? Okay. So tell me what I can do better. Because if you don't ask those questions, how are you ever going to grow? You're not. Yeah. I could think I know the answer, but I, I don't because everyone's answer to every question is going to be different. So you don't know. So that's 
what needed to be done to improve my skills, I think. Yeah, and well, that's important too, because I think that also requires an underlying confidence that you had to have in yourself and a genuine desire to grow and improve. Because I know so many people who absolutely do not want to hear what they can or should be doing better. They already think they've got it. They're good. What's your advice to them anyway? And they're really not interested in any sort of critique, even if it's critique from the best place solely to be productive and grow moving forward. So it's like just the fact that you're able to subject yourself to what could potentially be some constructive criticism, I think is so important because you're right. That is absolutely one of the, one of the few ways that people can really take the next step and up level their life. But there are still so many people who are so afraid of feeling judged or criticized and it will internalize that where it becomes impossible to grow because it's like, unless you're being applauded, you don't want to hear it or can't hear it because it's scary and uncomfortable. So, I mean, props to you for being willing to do that because a lot of people won't. Yeah, that's, that's exactly true. Yeah. That's, I mean, well said, definitely. (laughs) I mean, if you can't take criticism, I, 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 I mean, I would be nowhere. Yeah. You have to do things wrong. I feel like that's when you learn better. Yeah. So, Definitely. Definitely everything you just said. Do you think Instagram or social media in general has impacted or changed how hair business happens nowadays? Because I mean, like I remember the the old days where you had to take a paper calendar book to the salon with you and book an appointment on your scheduler. So it's so different now. How does something like Instagram or social play a role in your business? And what's your strategy to like make it work for you now that you are calling all of the shots on your own biz. Yeah. I mean, this, like you just said, a paper scheduler. I mean, look at where we are right now. (laughs) You book an appointment, it texts you a link to your calendar. Like you can't miss the appointment. I mean, you can't, it's, it's, it is crazy. (laughs) But so I, yeah, social media was huge for me. That was how I even grew my book. Uh, there was no, there was no way I would have been able to do it without it, honestly. Um, I mean, it's the overall picture that you paint is what people perceive of you. And that was Instagram. No one would have any idea who I am. And if they maybe heard about me, they would go on Instagram and they would judge my last nine pictures that are up on my, (laughs) on my preview. And that would be it. And thankfully I was able to take classes and learn how to take good pictures and learn what looks good, what lighting. I mean, I would bring, I bought this background off of Amazon that was like this giant plastic roll that I had with these like industrial clips that I would put on the mirror just to get this white background because I couldn't stand clutter in the background of my pictures. Mm-hmm. It's crazy, but I, you, you can't take it lightly. You cannot take social media lightly at all when it comes to business. And me personally on social media, it doesn't exist anymore. I once was like me personally with, uh, you know, thousands of followers and then I got hacked. And when I got hacked, yeah, I know. I mean, it was just my personal, it was really fine. But when I got hacked, I was like in the middle of building my hair page and I was like, I don't have time to post this. Like, this is stupid. So I have one picture I think that I posted from like over a year ago. It's, it is a social platform and you only have so much time to be social. So Mm. I, use that time to market to the people I want to see and connect with the clients that I have. That's a whole other thing is like, I love being able to see what my clients are doing. When I see them smiling in a picture and their hair looks amazing. I'm like, yes, (laughs) I did that. (laughs) I helped you look like that and you're happy and you're confident. And this is, it's everything. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it definitely works for you. There are also, as I'm learning, there are so many things to take advantage of as far as, online marketing and software, different softwares and everything. So yeah, you need to, you need to make it work for you. And it's a lot of time and a lot of planning, but it does work. Mm -hmm. So what's been the biggest challenge you would say in starting your own business from scratch? Uh, The biggest challenge was definitely, you know, I would say that if this was a problem, this would have been the biggest challenge is my partner and I are very open to criticism 
and do not hold back at all. Like her husband thinks we are so crazy because we'll be like, <laughs> can't do it that way because blah, blah. And then we just bark back and forth. And then we realize we're both right. It's, it's like this, it's a fun game. It's fun. <laughs> that, if you can't take criticism again, that would have been the biggest struggle. But thankfully that was not. And that helped us work through everything so incredibly quick. Um, the biggest challenge was probably the short turnaround time. That, I mean, it definitely was. It was the most stressful thing, one of the most stressful things I had ever gone through. But we worked well under pressure and made it happen. And when Kara was down, I picked her up and vice versa. It really, and I'm so thankful that I had her. This is definitely not something that could have been done alone. Team is so important, even though it was two of us as a team and we weren't even really able to tell anybody about it. It was worth everything because you had somebody to lean on. And it's almost like when you see, <clears throat> I would compare it to a relationship. When you see your partner down, you can't kick them while they're down. You know that, okay, I might want to say something right now, but they're down and I need to pick them up. And suddenly your needs aren't there anymore. It's like, mm -hmm. that's how I feel like Kara and I worked. It's okay. She's down. She's worked up about that. I need to help her get through that. And then we'll move to the next thing. Like you got to fix it before you can do anything. Band-aids don't work. You know, mm. they don't. Yeah. It needs full conversation, open communication, because I feel like, again, with how I left, I think it was all such assuming and poor communication. And unfortunately, like you think the worst in people and it's, it, it spirals. So open communication is definitely the biggest thing that needed to happen. So yeah. that's what I would say. So in starting your business with Kara, who's one of your best friends, and Kara is also a phenomenal stylist for anybody listening, <laughs> um, what advice would you give to anyone considering doing something so big, like starting a business with someone who is a close friend? So like, is there anything you guys wish you had known or discussed maybe before diving in as head first as you had to, especially since it was so quick? Um, or any advice you'd give if people are looking at their bestie like, hey, let's do this business together that you wish you would have known? I think that because Kara and I, I mean, we're months in and having the time of our lives, like things are amazing. I met her less than a year ago. Yeah. I think that not knowing every single thing about her inside out was for a benefit because the way that our relationship started was professional. And we work together to see how we could better our social media and better our clients. So I think that really was, uh, that was a good thing because we knew how we worked and we both are so insane. <laughs> I'm like, we're both so nuts that <clears throat> I, I couldn't have asked for a better partner because we balance each other out and she definitely makes me a better stylist. She makes me a better person because she can call me out when I'm, not doing my best and vice versa. So we work together very often. So that's how we got to know each other's work ethic and techniques. So through those experiences, it didn't take long for us to realize that we would make a good team. We were like, okay, we're passionate about the exact same things. We're open to criticism. We want the best for people. We want to make a nice lives for ourselves. We want to make people feel good. It was kind of like, don't complicate it. Mm -hmm. That And when we were, Writing our operating agreement, which still has yet to be signed because, again, quick turnaround, but <laughs> that was what it was. It was like, keep it simple, stupid, because I overcomplicate every single thing in my life. Same. And Kara does on everything that I don't. So it balances out. But what we did and suggest is to sit down and talk through every single work aspect, scenarios, expectations, what ifs. If I'm like, if you break your leg tomorrow, if you, if anything happens, if she goes crazy and <laughs> the country, what's going to happen? So yeah. we're honest and frank with each other and we take criticism well. So we're there to help each other improve on a personal level, which definitely helps our business grow. And I think that open communication is everything. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and that's interesting too, because it almost sounds like you guys were colleagues first, friends second. Yes. So it's yeah. interesting because that, and that makes perfect sense too, where you almost figured out that the alignment in how you work was there first and then through working together became such good friends. So that's also interesting because I feel like a lot of people might think about doing a business or some venture with their, and they're thinking, well, who's my best friend? Who do I get along with the best? 
mm-hmm. instead of who do I work with the best, which I mean, hey, maybe that affects the success rate of both the business and the friendship. Yep. Absolutely. What's been one of the biggest lessons you've learned in going from employee to employer since you're now starting to hire people? All right. So (laughs) (laughs) uh, I would say the biggest thing I've learned is that everything I do, everything I say affects our business and it controls the tune Mm. and controls the tune and the message our employees and clients receive each moment of each day. So our goal is to support and teach each other in a respectful work environment. There isn't room in the suite to have anything except positive communication. There mm-hmm. is not room. We never want to put our clients in any type of situation where it may be negative, no matter how you're feeling that day, what's going on at home. I mean, if your goldfish died, if you're just having a bad day, like it's got to be put away. It's got to be put behind the, like it's got to be talked about later. So with this, we definitely build each other up with skill and confidence. And this is also where that age um, uh, experience comes into play. Oh, we have people that are obviously less experienced stylists now. And I learned from them. Like, hey, I saw this video last night. It's this. I'm like, great. Send this to me. I would love to see what they did. And then we talk about it. And I say, guess what? That's not going to work because X, Y, Z. And he's like, oh, wow, you're right. And it just builds it builds. Um, so it creates a happy place to where our clients can retreat. I almost think of it like a pizza. I mean, you can take as much of the pizza as you want, but if you're splitting that pizza evenly with employees, that pizza of everything that like the money, the education, everything, if everybody takes a piece, everyone wins all of the time, every single time Mm -hmm. everybody wins because everybody gets some of it. That's awesome. awesome. And being in the small suite environment, it allows you to focus on each individual employee 110% until they're 110% ready to be the stylist that they want to be. It's not about filling chairs in a salon to generate revenue. It's about focusing on what the team needs, making sacrifices necessary to help them, to help them make the money they want to make, to help them succeed. And the money and the success follows. Like when you're focused on them as a person and growing how they need to grow, which is a learning curve every single day. Because mm-hmm. you're not inside someone's head. You don't, I mean, now I know how two of my employees learn, but I mean, now we have another one. So it's like, you got to focus on them and what they need. And if the money doesn't follow, it's still success. Knowing that you did everything you could to help someone that looked up to you to grow. I mean, mm-hmm. the road to success, it's, it's not driven alone. And it, team is everything. You need, whether your team is big or small and being able to say, check yourself if something is negative. I I mean, that's, that's everything. Yeah. So what advice would you give to any younger listeners who maybe are prodigies in their own right and maybe feel afraid of judgment or discrimination because of the year on their birth certificate? What would you, what would you tell them? And basically it's like, what would you tell 16 year old Mary? (laughs) Yeah. Right. I would say, don't be afraid to tell your parents or your guardians, whoever you look up to in your life, what you really want to do. To research the best road to take for yourself and to pray or meditate or whatever you want to do for the strength and knowledge you need to work hard and succeed. You need to trust your heart, but you need to, your mind kind of has to follow. I definitely went after my heart on everything. Everything I did was definitely driven by my heart. But then you got to you got to check yourself. It's almost like a relationship. You might really love somebody, but think in your head, is this really the best thing for me? Mm. And I think that goes for the same thing in the career and I think the year on your birth certificate is the year on your birth certificate. I mean, I, I always like have a joke. It's I always say I'm ageless. I'm like, "Oh, all of you, oh, I'm ageless." That's actually what I said too. <laughs> <laughs> our landlord when he asked me how old I was and I was like I'm actually just not going to tell you because I just don't think it's necessary for you to know um and if you feel like there are ways that you look immature and maybe you feel like that's holding you back then find a podcast look around talk to somebody you look up to and say listen I feel like I'm lacking in this how do I grow from it mm. the amount of times I texted my dad and was just like I feel like the way I speak isn't good can you help me because <laughs> 
the way he speaks when he's telling me something, it sounds like a, a textbook. Mm-hmm. So it's, you got to reach out. Not, don't be afraid of criticism, but also don't be afraid to follow your heart. Make sure your head's following right behind. I love that. So I want to wrap things up by asking you a question that I ask all guests who come on the Thrive podcast. And that is, what does Thrive mean to you? And how do you strive to thrive in your own everyday life? Wonderful question. (laughs) Um, So this is always the best part of the podcast. To me, Thrive, it it means to overcome and succeed. Every day I pray I have what it takes to work hard and do what I need to succeed that day and always take time to be thankful for who and what I have in my life. Mm. Being thankful, it keeps me focused on where I am and where I'm going and who helped me get there. I, I, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't want to say I wouldn't be nothing, but I wouldn't be nearly everything I am without the people who got me there. And the tools I use, I mean, you have to be thankful and you find more appreciation for yourself, for people when you are thankful. To thrive also to me means to get, get away from the poisonous people, get away, mm-hmm. run the opposite direction, get the yes. hell away. <laughs> and it's hard. It could be someone you grew up with your entire life. And I, I know people are probably thinking of that, like one person or that one friend, that one coworker, get away. Who cares? They can, I mean, who cares? It doesn't matter. And once you run away and get away from them, congratulate yourself. You have to congratulate yourself. You have to be like, okay, when you're feeling down, look, I did this and you know what? I can't sit here and be down because I have to, I have to keep moving. Mm -hmm. Um, Thriving to me is also the only thing better to me and what I've learned this on such an amazing level where I am right now is there is no better feeling like the only better feeling than climbing to the top is reaching down to help somebody else. Mm. It's the most priceless thing. And that's where I say like the money and the success will come because if I just, if I can just help people and bring value to their life, that's worth more than anything. And it's worth more than any dollar amount. You can't, you can't put a price on that. You can't put a price on confidence. And when you are able to give other people confidence and help them, I mean, again, it's priceless. I mean, you got to just feel the fear, like feel the doubt, like every, all the negativity, let it fuel you. That's thriving is take it all and just like a machine. Like, I feel like that's, I like don't even know the right words to say, but (laughs) feel the fear, feel the doubt and do it anyway. I love that. Follow your heart, follow your head and always, always look back and be thankful And again, although leaving how I had to leave in the salon and knowing that people say God knows what, you can't tell everyone everything. You can't, you can't, you have to be thankful for what was in the past because it made you who you are. So if you're craving more, just do it, make room and do it. Make room and do it. I love that. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on Thrive, Mary. I'm so happy that you were finally able to make your podcast debut. Uh, you tell, tell us. This is, like, <laughs> this is like my big break. No, I'm totally kidding. This is just, <laughs> I really appreciate it, especially on a podcast like this. Like, oh my gosh, this is everything. I'm oh, so happy I love so it. Funny. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Tell us where can people find you online and how can all my local girls get their booties in your chair. You can find us uh, online. Everything is pretty much the same word. So it's main techniques, M A N E techniques.com at main techniques on Instagram. My personal Instagram, well, my hair, my personal hair Instagram is at Mary period T period techniques. And I love questions. I love like people asking me questions. And even if it's not about hair, please feel free to reach out. I love it. (laughs) As you can tell, I love to talk. Oh my God, these poor people listening to this podcast, (laughs) but reach out anyway, DM, email, 
it's all, uh, our email is in case anyone needs it. It's clients first at main techniques.com. So I hope to hear from you guys soon. And Erica, I cannot thank you enough for this. So thank you so much for having me. Of course. I'm sure I'll see you very soon. <laughs> yes, I will definitely see you soon. And enjoy the rest of your week. And drive out there, everybody. <laughs>